of snapshots of what we have seen out there. Um, and I know it's, you know, a lot of people are like, oh no, I don't want to hear, I don't want to see that. But this really happened. And so I want to make sure that you know, I don't like talking about it any more than anybody else. I don't like to get those calls from the teams or emails when I see things that, you know, we think we have an IJ in this facility. I, I hate that too. You know, not, none of us like to see that. That's a lot of work on everybody. But, you know, really getting to know your residents and providing that quality of care, we can combat some of this. Uh, we do have um, an issue with an unlicensed nurse. Um, the facility did verify the, the work history of this person. They reversed the security number and nursing license before hiring this person um, as an LPN, and they weren't licensed. So they weren't licensed in our state. They worked, as you see here, for 20 shifts as an LPN, caring for more than 70 residents. They failed to implement their policies to prevent medical neglect. Um, and, and, and so we cited this at the VA Jeopardy level. Um, we've seen several cases of this over time, um, but we had this as one significant, and just, just this year that we wanted to share with you. You know, I talked about um, the diet, and when we were talking yesterday to some of our, some of the new companies in Florida, we were talking about some of the trends. Um, I've been sharing this with Debbie Franklin, the quality director here at FHCA, and some of the things that we, we've seen, some very, you know, serious cases of residents choking while eating their, their meals. Um, so here's one, I just wanted to show you just a snapshot, long diet, consistency, um, person choked, resident had a diet order for ground meat, um, and unfortunately the resident was served a whole hamburger patty, and subsequently choking event, airway blockage, um, 11 days later another resident was served a sandwich with whole slices of bread and dinner, the resident diet order for a mechanically altered diet, which requires all bread to be pureed. So just, a couple of examples, and we, we've had some very serious examples of actually residents dying related to um, their dietary, you know, and, and if residents, you know residents need assistance, <laughs> even if it's just visual cues and monitoring, you know, and they're eating in their rooms with the door shut, you know, that's a problem. It may not be a problem today, but it might be a problem tomorrow, and that problem tomorrow might result in immediate jeopardy. So make sure that you're paying attention to your, to your residents. This goes to that supervision of those residents that need assistance that are dependent with ADLs. And now I think this is my last one. Uh, falls of serious injuries. Um, and as you see here, you know, I know that we talk about sometimes you don't have just one tag, you have multiple tag. Resident, uh, physically impaired resident, dependent on staff for care and service, required that two person assist. Um, and there was one staff member resulting in a fall with fatal injuries. The person fell um, from their bed. And again, this resulted in multiple fractures and injuries. The residents succumbed um, to their death the following day. So we do have some very significant incidents. And, and I mean, nobody wants that you know, to happen in their facility. You do not want to know that there was something that happened in your facility that was avoidable and a resident you know, died because of something in your facility. So I'm going to know from you guys, you know, what we can do, you know, in our state to help this, to help keep our, you know, to, to really, you know, reduce these number of significant survey findings that we have. More than, more than happy to sit on any work groups, have any conversations, you know, that's what it's about. You know, we can't do this alone, uh, but what can we do to, to help, you know, working with associations, working with the various companies, but what can we do to help? Um, that this embraces that quality of care of our residents. So here's some pointers for you. I hope that you really take these back. Be proactive. You know, that's really what coffee's about, right? Coffee's a period, right? But be proactive. Evaluate your systems using your facility assessment. You know, as we talked about, your facility assessment is not one size fits all. So look at your facility assessment, and your facility assessment may change year to year. It may change. You know, the culture in your facility may be different now than it was, you know, a year ago or two years ago. Everybody's been through a lot in the past couple of years with COVID and, um, and other things going on. So, you know, look at that. You know, look at your facility assessment. Um, adequate and competent nursing staff, and we know that's key. We know that's very key. That's why it was so exciting to hear um, that, you know, really a lot of buildings getting agency staff out of their buildings. And quality is imperative. That is so critical. You know, to what you do, and I'm surprised it took 
of the Division of Nursing Homes out of CMS so many years to put quality requirements in our nursing homes. This has been a foundation, a, found, a fundamental requirement in hospitals for years. Even in our um, ESRDs for years, these quality requirements have been in place using that data-driven approach to really be proactive. Focus on your high-risk areas. Everybody in here, you're hearing me talk, you know, I've sat in conferences too, and uh, when people are talking about things, I sat in the state director's meeting in June, and as we were having presentations by other states, I was listening to these other states talk about whether it's policies they have in place, how they do QA, they have to do survey training, and I was listening, I was thinking about, how do we do that in Florida? Can we take some of this? So I hope that's what you're doing, is listening as I talk about, focusing on those high-risk areas. What are some high-risk areas you have in your facility? Do you, take, do you have trait residents? You know, are you a facility that has taken in residents that are diagnosed with candida oris? You know, those are some of your high risk areas. You know, maybe residents who are, you know, have diagnosis of diabetes. We know that's a big issue. Um, high volume or problem prone areas for improvement. You know, think about those areas that you have in your facility. Not one size fits all. So you have to look at your individual facility and follow your compliance and ethics program. Follow your compliance and ethics program. That's very important. We have ethical requirements as state um, as state employees. Um, we have to maintain a certain um, you know conduct because we you know we can have conduct on becoming a state employee. I don't know what that means, but I guess if I you know put run screaming out of here, somebody might say what's wrong with her. But you know we have to think about that as you know that conduct and, and you as well. You know, looking at your compliance and ethics, and, and thinking about that, you know, as we as we look at some of the immediate jeopardy tags that we have had, you know, applying these requirements, that being proactive, and really looking at your your programs and your individual facility. I mean, I know a lot of you have you know larger corporations, and some of your corporations also have facilities outside of the state of Florida. Um, that's great, but look at your policies specific to your facility. You know, if you have a company that has facilities in Wisconsin, you know, some things are, they're very, Wisconsin's very different. You know, their environment's very different. You know, so think about that, no one size fits all, but look at those high risk, high prone areas that you have, and really thinking about your compliance and ethics program. CMS is really focused on, on the compliance and ethics, and I'm sure more will come over time with the requirements for that.